I began my martial arts um, enthusiasm, I guess, when I was about 11. And that was in um, Taiho Jiu-Jitsu, which is a very old form of Jiu-Jitsu. The reason that I did is my brother and I, uh, who's no longer living, uh, we had found a little book. And this book showed jujitsu moves. So my brother and I took this book and we trained from the book. And my father, who uh, was a federal agent and kind of knew a lot of people, my father got us set up with a fellow, and I don't even remember the name because I was uh, too young. And we learned um, Taiho Jiu-Jitsu. Now, um, even the name, as I look back, I had to put together that that's what it was <laughs> because um, it was in America at that time. This was in the 60s. You know, this had been 65. I had never even heard of karate uh, or anything like that. But jujitsu, I had heard of. So um, my father was transferred in 1967, the start, to um, Twin Falls, Idaho. And knowing my brother and my interest, he almost immediately found an instructor for us. How he found him, I don't know, because it was not a commercial school. In fact, um, commercial schools, not many existed at that time. But he found this man, and his name was Robert Tidd, T-I-D-D. Robert Tidd had trained under Robert Triez. Now, Robert Triez was considered the father of karate in America at the time. He was very well known. He had uh, trained in... Um, Japan or Okinawa probably when he was in the military and he brought the art back with him. So Mr. Ted, Sensei Ted, had uh, been in the military and I think that was their connection. So he trained under him and then he trained us. And uh, at the time, I believe it was uh, Goju-ru, but later became Ishin-ru, uh, I believe. Anyway, so trained with him, and um, my brother and I uh, were advancing fairly soon, I mean, fairly uh, similar. He was older than me, so he advanced a little faster. But by the time we were yellow belt, um, Raymond Tabosa came on the scene. So that's Grandmaster Raymond Tabosa, uh, Batikan. Uh, we called him Sensei and O Sensei because it was a karate system. So Robert Ted had gotten acquainted with him, and this was in San Francisco when Raymond Tavosa had come over because he was, uh, at that time, training to be a life insurance salesman. And so there were seminars in San Francisco that he went to, but the, the crux of the seminars actually became him and Robert Tidd training together once he found out that he was a martial artist. And um, he, Robert Tidd became very enamored with Raymond Tabosa's Kajikumi, which he had actually developed um, in the mid 50s and started training people in about 1958. So Robert Tidd switched from being under Robert Triaz to being under uh, Raymond Tabosa. And so he would go to these seminars, they would meet, they would train. In fact, he took my brother to one of the seminars at one point, and uh, so he could meet him and, and train also. But he determined that uh, we would all switch from the system that Triez was doing to the Tabosa system, Kajikumi. So that is exactly what we did. We switched and uh, training began under the Tabosa. Uh, eventually, Raymond Tabosa came to Twin Falls and he made trips about twice a year, approximately. Spent about a week, sometimes longer, 
with us. And so we had uh, Master Raymond Tobosa and then Master Toby Tobosa, which was his brother. Now, Toby Tobosa was a little bit uh, different. He, he was more uh, main, in the mainland because he was a um, Federal Aviation Administration fellow. So he was stationed at one point in Oklahoma. Uh, I didn't get to see him when he was there. But they, 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 they had their own personalities. And so Toby would come when Raymond would come over too and train us. So we would learn the art, uh, the Kaji art. And each of us by that time, so several years passed, each of us by that time were assigned a form that we had to learn the form directly from uh, either Batikan or from Toby. And then we had to teach everybody else, in, including our sensei. We had to teach him the, that system. And they figured this, this was the best way to get us the whole system uh, in increments. So um, my assignment basically was pin on Yodan in the Kajikumi system. And as time went past, other things were introduced, such as the Kajikatas and uh, uh, staff forms and, and different things. You know, as you progress in rank, you, you, uh, you get new material, so to speak. So that was the origin. So Kaji itself is Karate, which is Chinese Kempo. This came through um, Fred Lara, who was under um, Raymond Chow and T um, Tos uh, Matosi. So they were, they were under him, and that's where the, our, our karate mostly came from. However, Batikan was good friends with um, Masoyama Sensei. And so <clears throat> we had the influence of Masoyama uh, and the Kempo together, and that was our karate, but also it was sort of uh, spun with the Tobosa approach to it. So it didn't look exactly like either one of those. So we had both hard and soft in the karate portion of it because of the tobosas and because of the fact that they were influenced by Aikido. Now Aikido, and I can't remember the instructor's name, but uh, basically it um, was uh, through um, Tohi, um, who, was, uh, who kind of uh, was very popular, becoming very popular with his uh, focus on ki uh, in the Aikido. So, so Kaji is Karate, which is that Chinese Kempo, Aikido, and then Jay was Jiu-Jitsu, which was Danzan Jiu-Jitsu. And so our Jiu-Jitsu was, <clears throat> I don't know how to describe it other than the fact what, uh, that it was, uh, it, it just fit in very well with our other moves. and. Typically, it involved um, locks and grabs and takedowns and throws, <clears throat> basic throws, and uh, just kind of the, the heart of what you think of old jujitsu style is, breaking and uh, what Batikan would call jujitsu tricks, which was just things that you could do in, in self-defense. But then the I of Kaji, K-A-J-I, <clears throat> stood for Iskrima. Now, Iskrima is a spelling that I've never seen outside of the Kaji groups. But <clears throat> Iskrima came uh, presumably through the uh, Benesaya language. I don't know why the I was, was used for Iskrima, I-S-K-R-I-M-A is how it was spelled at that time. Because when you look at the Spanish word, it's Esgrima. And then you see what the Filipinos did to it. Some kept the, uh, they, they all dropped the G for Esgrima, which was just meant fencing or skirmish. And uh, a lot of them put in a K. And Batikano, it had both C and K in Esgrima. The C was more indicative of Spanish spellings. I've seen it both ways from him in, on paperwork that he's given us and so forth, had given us. But uh, along the way, uh, he saw that um, a lot of people were using the E instead of the I. So whatever dialect it came from, don't know. But uh, so it became an E for us. But of course, that didn't work in with 
kaji with an I because because it's an E. Uh, but anyway, that's why kaji has the I in it. And that was um, a fairly simple system. Basically, it was the Cinco Terros system. Cinco Terros is five strikes. And that system that we did was primarily uh, taught to Vatican by his father, Maximo Tobosa. So it was, uh, we, we didn't learn any more than the five strikes at that time. We learned Sagong Sagawas, parry to the outside, and Alakuntra, to hit to the inside, but it wasn't actually a, a stop hit because it was long range. So it was what would be called a switch hit. So it's a, it's a hit through the uh, opponent's hand and then coming back. But parry to the outside is kind of the same because it pushes against the, hits the hand of the opponent and pushes through, but then it has to come back too. So they're really the same thing going different directions, opposite directions. But that was it. Uh, so that's what we had. And that was our weapons art along with the form, the, the bow staff forms that the, Tobosas gave to us. Eskrima, Kali, and everything became, started to become very popular. Prior to this, um, Batikan had wanted to teach just the Filipino martial arts. But one of his instructors, I don't know who, uh, said, we don't want you teaching this yet. Um, part of that is because uh, it would be to non-Filipinos and also, uh, they, it, there's a uh, culture of secrecy in Filipino martial arts. It was kept secret from the Spanish, uh, hidden from them in dances and, and different things while people learned the art. So part of that was a cultural thing, but um, it became popular really in 1973, I guess, when uh, Bruce Lee's show came out, Enter the Dragon. His, his, the, I guess really the first one that became popular. And it became popular, or it was, it was in there because Dan Inosanto had shown him some Eskrima moves. And I don't even think Dan Inosanto at that time had much training in it, but it, it grew over the years. So he had taught him these different moves, um, mostly uh, Sinawali, but if you, even if you look at that movie, it's, it's very stiff sort of movements. Uh, he, he does it more like it's a karate weapon than a Filipino weapon. But that became so popular that um, uh, in Hawaii they, they thought, well, you know, there's going to be a lot of crazy things happening. We'll start a club. So they started the first club there in Hawaii. It was actually, I think it was before um, Grandmaster Padoy even started his group. But they all kind of started up at about the same time. They were friends and uh, they trained together, shared information. And so he started up the club really in 1973 and put out flyers and it had the flyers had him on one side and um, Grandmaster Flora Villabrell on the other side, which was one of his main teachers. And so they started teaching the uh, Kali Eskrima. At first, the Vatican just told us it was called Kinesog. And Kinesog meant the way of the crab. <clears throat> I haven't been able to find that exact uh, terminology in several languages, Filipino languages, so I assume it was simply a, um, uh, it could have been an abbreviation of something. I I'm not certain. But the way it's actually said is, uh, the Lan Kasag. So that is the way of Kasag. <coughs> and this word Kasag, Batikan spelled with a C. Uh, the Benesayan spelling is with a K, and it means swimming crab. So there's a distinction between swimming crab and a land crab. But that Kasag means swimming crab. Anyway, there's a, I suppose there's a whole story behind that also. But the point was that um, Batikan this was kind of his his heart to, to teach the Filipino martial arts even while Kaji was starting to become known to you know us and other groups so in the sort of the mainland there's probably three schools at that time 
So he decided that um, Kaji would sort of start to fade into the background while Kasag came forward. And uh, he told us, he said, uh, I want this to happen. I want, I want, Kaji, I want you guys to basically uh, either, either teach both if you can, which I tried for a while. It's very difficult to do. I speak Japanese in one and then other dialect in the other. And uh, in one is more uh, angular and, and strong and um, uh, tightened moves. And the other, it's very fluid moves. So it had a... Had, I can see why he wanted it to fade in the background because <clears throat> combat sequences generally are, are uh, they're, they're faster when they're more fluid. And it was a weapons art that moves into empty hand. So uh, the kaji was to kind of fade in the background and it did. I, I, I was the only one teaching both for a long time. And then I just simply went to, um, the Kasag. As time went past, you know, uh, I was teaching just Kasag, and um, there were other people in our in our organization that were uh, one person that really loved the Kaji. He continued teaching Kaji, and now he teaches a different system altogether. And then the other fellow with that trained with me, we we went all the way to Filipino martial arts. Okay, so that was a, <clears throat> that was sort of my journey at, to that point. Well, um, this Robert Tid that I speak of uh, broke away from the Tabosas to start his own group. So all of the black belts at that time were loyal to him and they followed him. I had, since I had known the Tabosas for a long time, since I was really a kid, 13, I... Uh, I had got I had a connection with them even at that age so we started communicating directly I explained to them what had happened and they didn't know a thing about it because Robert Tidd was kind of didn't tell them what he was doing anyway I told them what had happened they confronted him he admitted it and so uh, he was no longer part of the group so, the, so myself and two others became the main people in the, well, we were in the mainland. We became the, the heads of the system for the mainland, except for the one fellow that's gone now. Uh, we became the, the co-inheritors in a, in a manner of speaking for the, for the system, but in the mainland. So Batikan made kind of a distinction that Hawaii was a bit different than the mainland. Uh, so, but in Hawaii, uh, we have um, Don Mendoza, who is the head maestro. He's considered head maestro over everything, but I'm his senior. So it's an odd thing. I understood that Batikan wanted someone of Filipino heritage to, to head the group. Don and I are great friends. We're brothers. Uh, and so this, it didn't mean anything to me. It was fine. You know, I had no problem with that. Uh, if Don said today, hey, uh, Maestro Michael, I, I think you should do this, I would say, you got it, I'll, I'll do that, it sounds good. <laughs> you know, but it, it isn't that way. He doesn't direct me. Um, uh, in fact, we, we would share something because over time, uh, as Batikan instructed, the art continues to grow and we add in things from our own experience. Now, what Batikan did for both Hawaii and us I almost feel a little bit more in the mainland, but it, you know, not necessarily. Uh, is he is he let other people teach us? So this is very unusual that uh, he would be so open to them. But they were his friends, and um, he said, to "Learn what they've got to teach you," and it just becomes part of what you do. So he put us with people like um, Grandmaster Gilbert Tino, <clears throat> a little bit with Narababao. Um, uh, Leo Haron, we were a part of an organization called uh, West Coast Escrima Society. And so uh, we were in those very, very early gatherings of uh, Escrimadors in Stockton. And uh, they trained us personally in their homes. So that was pretty uh, exciting time to learn that. So, but those things influenced us. Another person that he brought to us and had 
had him train us was Nate Defenser. Nate Defenser is more of an eclectic guy, and so uh, we were learning things that he, he was teaching us. We had no idea where they're from, uh, but he, he had learned a lot from um, the, Dan and Asanto uh, and different people in Stockton that he had sought out. Um, I think La Costa was uh, one of them because as I later on in time, as I see different different things on YouTube, I say, oh, well, uh, Nate taught us that. So we know how to do that. And so it's sort of a, it sort of becomes part of our art because that's kind of the way Batikan wanted to do it. But anyway, Batikan also taught Nate the, the Kasag system. So Nate always pays tribute to him, or he, he's dead now. Right, just recently. Unfortunately, just recently. But he always did pay tribute to him. And Nate and I kept in contact over the years. Uh, we never get, got together again. Uh, that Because when we got together, it was 1984. So it's a few years ago. We kept someone in contact. Um, he uh, also was, uh, through Leo Haron, uh, Dave Hines was a big part of our, our group way back then. And uh, Dave was at seminars, and uh, uh, Batikan gave him the stage, so to speak, several times to teach us uh, parts of the, um, uh, the system that he learned from Leo Haron, which uh, he calls Bahalana. Uh, come what may. So that's, all those things are things that influenced us. And so uh, I think it's reflected in the Kasag of today uh, in the mainland. I mean, I never got a chance to know him. What was Batikan like? You know, he, he had Filipino roots, but he grew up in Hawaii. His father came from um, the, uh, actually I'm not sure, he w I don't even know if he was sure which town he came from in the Visayas. But, um, you know, the questions you forget to ask your father and then they're gone, that type of thing. But uh, he was Visayan. And um, so Batikan grew up kind of in a dual culture of um, the Filipino culture and the um, uh, Hawaiian culture. But his mother was from Japan. So she was Japanese. So he had also that influence. He, he loved the... Um, Japanese arts. You asked me what he's like. I'm kind of getting there, I guess, in a sense. Uh, to give you the sense of how he grew up, as far as I know, anyway. So he grew up working the um, pineapple fields in Hawaii. So this would be um, in Oahu. I can't think of the town it was. It was just a, it was a small town, and he was in an atmosphere where there were a lot of martial arts going on. He was trained in boxing by a, uh, a champion of the camps. Um, his name was Kuba. He had a love through his father and through others of the martial arts from a really early age. Kind of like you are as a martial artist, uh, I am as a martial artist. You, you see something, it looks good, you, you want to do it, you want to do it well, and, and you love it. Well, he was the same way. So he had a lot of different uh, avenues of training. When you think of Batikan as in his personality, he was very Hawaiian. So he was very loving and very approachable. Um, he was, uh, you know, t today in Hawaii there, I, I had noticed because having been there, um, not all the Hawaiians like the Haoles, you know, the, the white folks. Batikan never had that in, his, in anything that he ever did with us. If he called us Howley, we, were, we joked around about because we knew what it meant. Um, and, and so we weren't that to him. We were kind of like his adopted kids in, in the mainland. And he treated us that way. So he did everything the Ohana way, which is a family way. It wasn't a thing for profit. Uh, certainly we, we paid for his expenses uh, when he came to Idaho. But um, he wasn't trying to make a buck from it. He was he, he wanted his name known because uh, it was his art form and he had worked hard to to gather the different arts into it. But he wasn't egotistical. Uh, he was just always um, always a friend. He was always a teacher, and he wasn't he wasn't concerned um, 
he wasn't mostly concerned about your your training ability. He was mostly concerning about how concerned about how you're living your life. So there were people through the history that um, were very skilled, but they were immoral in some way, or they did something immoral or something that was against their own family, and so he would dismiss them from training. So they couldn't be part of the group anymore, and that was the reason why. Um, and then other people, he uh, let kind of let go because they wanted to, they had some other ambition. Um, you know, and one, one of those people is uh, Joy Delmar. She uh, and Mike Delmar were married, and he had a, I, I don't know the history of that actually, so I probably shouldn't speak to it, but I know that she wanted to, to leave the system and, and go into uh, Mike's system. So Vatika and I have the letter that he wrote to her. It was very gracious to her. And, um, but it was sort of uh, sad too, sort of heartbreaking when you, when you read this letter. But he was the kind of guy that uh, didn't get angry with her where he could have. He didn't say, well, you've betrayed me. He could have. But um, he let her go, you know, just, a, just in a gracious way. So I guess when we say when you say what was Batikan like, um, he was he was a good man. He was a good man. He treated us well, treated us just like as if we were his own, and uh, took care of us. We we did our best to um, to do things like uh, um, you know pay for something at a at a meal, and he, he and he had already paid for it. We never knew. <laughs> he was just that way. Um, Anyway, I don't know if that answers the question or not, sure. but yeah, he's just, he's just a good man. Yeah, sounds yeah. like sounds Toby too. Like a great man, Toby too. Yeah, Toby was a great guy. He was a different personality. He was um, he had a real serious side to him. So when Body Khan taught, so you kind of describe the way that Toby taught uh, being different from Body Khan. How did Body Khan teach the art? Body Khan was more of a. Um, do as I do. So you'd ask him a question and he might say a few words about it, but he would say, watch. So he would, he would do something and, and he would say, the best way to show you is to tell you to move as I move. And Toby, on the other hand, I mean, he has the same approach in a way, but it was more like, no, you have to go this way. You have to move this arm from here, and uh, you know you have to put uh, th this uh, <clears throat> this emphasis on this movement, and not on this movement. So he was a little more technical, but I suspect that <clears throat> it had a lot to do with uh, their experiences um, in life. So Master Toby was with the Federal Aviation Administration. And he was fairly high up. He was like a GS-18, which I think is pretty high on the government. And so uh, he had been in the mainland, uh, and he spent a lot of time at the Honolulu Airport. Now, interestingly, uh, the Honolulu Airport is where uh, him and Richard Bastillo became friends. That's why Richard Bastillo kind of became friends with us. Uh, he was friends with a friend of mine, Joe Cowles. And... Um, but this is where they met, was at the Honolulu airport. So my, well, I guess my point is that uh, the difference is uh, Batikan <clears throat> um, was, he worked on Pearl Harbor, and he was a, uh, a foreman. They had different, um, you know, areas there where they had, uh, they're like civilians working in, in the naval per Pearl Harbor. In fact, uh, Villa Brel also worked in that uh, same uh, Pearl Harbor area that he was in. I'm not certain, but it possibly was that was their um, introduction, was working at the same place. Oh, wow. So, um, so Batikan wasn't as uh, traveled, I guess you would say, as uh, Toby was. And so I think this was kind of the difference in their in their personality. Toby had to deal with a lot of different things that um, Batikan maybe didn't have to deal with. 
how has the art changed over the years? Um, as, as you saw it while Batikan was still alive, I'm sure it was changing, and then how has it continued to change since his passing? I think the, the mainland groups and the Hawaii groups had very similar experiences, but a little bit different. So Batikan died in 1990 at the age of 66. And his, his instruction to us, and I'm certain the mainland, I mean the uh, Hawaii group, <clears throat> was that um, he didn't want the art to die. So he knew that if the art was going to continue to grow, it couldn't all be always be the same. And so he left it up to us. Once you, once you get to a certain level, uh, there becomes an obligation to um, uh, impress not only Batikan's personality on things, but also your own personality. So when we talk about how did it change, <clears throat> I think that you could say that it did change and it didn't change. It didn't change because the core is always the same. There's different emphasis. Uh, so Master Toby lived another 10 years. And so he had his own emphasis that he applied to uh, Kasag in Hawaii. So he didn't simply maintain it as it was. He, he, he imposed different things upon it based on his training. So um, <clears throat> in the mainland, myself and um, Rick Hills were from 1990 were, were basically it. And so although I kept in contact with Master Toby, it wasn't the type of contact where I would say, well, um, or he would say, for example, well, this is what we're doing today. I want you guys to do it. It, it wasn't like that. It was, you know, do whatever Batikan had you do. So our influences were, um, uh, were from the people that he had introduced to us. And um, training in the principles that he gave to us which naturally grow into other things. It happened in Hawaii, it happened here. So you would take, for example, um, Batikan would have a drill. That drill was um, what we simply called strike, cover, strike. So strike, cover, strike. It has two sides to it. And if you, if you look at it, you go, yeah, okay, so it has a defensive side and it has a, a fighting side. So basic, the principle, from Sagang Sagawas, which is pairing to the outside, is that it has this mathematical quality where one person strikes and the other one parries and then you strike back. So it's this give and take thing. And, and as you look at it over the years, it starts to fall into place with the philosophies that he uh, had told to us. And uh, you develop your own philosophy about it and you expand upon it. So when you think about you know, what he would say about a crab or what he would say about how the bamboo moves or the ocean, its effect on things. Uh, and you think about that and then you see the drills, you can see it within those drills. So you can take, for example, a drill like strike, cover, strike, and you can enhance it. Uh, you can enhance it. Well, strike, cover, strike. This could be, I could move this way and I could thrust like we did today. I could thrust and I could defend this thrust. It's all it is is strike, <laughs> strike, strike, but in this case, cover, strike again, or strike, strike, cover, strike, 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 cover. It's just that, that mathematical sequence of, of movements. So you look at that and then you look at the, um, the, so that would be like outside movements. Then you look at the inside movements. So you look at the quality of what happens in long range. How did he show us what happens in long range? Well, um, long range is a specific sort of range of combat. So there's certain principles that are in play in that long range. And then what about when you go into uh, another range, you get closer. So you're sort of in long range, sort of in medium range, so it's sort of a medium long range. And what are the qualities of those things? What is the length of my weapon? What is the substance of my weapon? Do I have a blade? Do I have a compulot? 
uh, a flat stick? Uh, do I have uh, my rattan stick? Do I have a heavy stick? It's not gonna move the same, so I wanna learn all of those ways that it moves. So, um, so you take those basic drills that he gave to us and you can see where they're headed and you shape them. And so um, I think the, how it's grown is that the drills have increased, but the, uh, the knowledge of the art has increased. So each of us has grown. So you get in Hawaii, so they do a lot for full contact fighting. So they'll, they'll do a lot of training for that. It's wonderful stuff. We haven't um, gone that direction so much, partly because we don't have the, uh, the venue for it. We don't have a lot of teams that want to go and have full contact fighting. We've, all, we've done it. I mean, we did it in Stockton when they had the very first ones. And um, so we know how to do it. It's just, and, and I just don't do it much in my club, but I do some. We have the gear and, and we do it. And Maestro Don taught us how to make the sticks that they use, and so we use them. But um, we don't emphasize it as much as they might. They, com they compete more with it. There's reasons for that. There's reasons that I, I don't go that way. Um, and I like, but they do, they do things and I like that too. So if you see us, we, we're, we're doing the same art, but we may have different emphasis. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of how the art's grown. So, you know, um, I think, uh, I, I don't know where I heard it. Maybe it was something Inosanto said. He said, uh, Etuan Kali, which he said meant, my, your Kali is yours. Uh, mine is mine. And all he was saying, and Batikan did the same thing, really. All he's saying is, you, you can't be me entirely. Yes, I will come through you, but you're yourself. And so your Kali is going to reflect who you are. So your Kali, Ken, will be different than my Kali. My student's Kali will be different than mine. Mine will be different than Batikan, but not different in the sense that it's an entirely different thing. It's because that the core is always there. The core is always moving through it. Uh, there's there's loyalty to that core, so I don't I have no desire whatsoever to say oh well I'm going to be a I'm going to be this guy I'm going to be a Pekiti Tersha guy or I'm going to be that guy uh, I'm going to do that art form no but I might say wow I like what those guys do and in, uh, in this situation I would like to steal that because that's a that's a way to do it. <laughs> No, but I mean, I would, I would like to incorporate that or, or I see something that has value. I would say, okay, class, now uh, I'm going to do this drill because I think it has value. Anyway, so that, that's, that's really the, the truth of all arts, of all systems. Uh, there's, there's no cookie cutter stuff, right? Yeah. Each, and each person isn't a, isn't a cutout cookie. <laughs> there are, each person is different. You come in with a set of skills. Uh, over the years, I, I trained in a lot of different arts. I trained in, in Kempo. Um, I trained, I mean, to like second degree black. I trained in Iaido to equivalent of first degree black, um, never formally ranked. Uh, and, but Iaijitsu, I trained in that. Um, I trained in Judo and uh, other Jiu Jitsus and this type of thing. Uh, but always with the thought of how can I how can I give this to Kasag to make it kind of a, to just to give it another angle right give it a little bit more so you know so I don't just know three things I know five things how do you see the the future of of the Tobosa art what, what do you see in the future for that well I hope it is in the future as it is now in a sense <clears throat> what I hope is that it doesn't take on the personality of other systems. I hope that the people in Kasag don't say, well, we're doing all this stuff because we saw it in seminars, so now that's Kasag. You know, that's, that's not Kasag. That kills Kasag. So the future is um, Kasag goes, it has its core, always its core, and then it has those elements that influence it, um, that help it to grow, 
And, it, and in 300 years, let's say, 300 years, the world lasts, <laughs> uh, you can look back and you can say, if you saw a video, you'd say, oh yeah, Cinco Terra. So we do it just like that. We do it like that, but, uh, you know, and, and we do Diez Terros or Doce or whatever. And, um, but, you know, uh, oh, we also do this. We add this in. But you should be able to look back and say, yeah, yeah, that's, that's who we are. Uh, th that's what I think it should be for, for the future. What do you think defines that core? What is that core to you? Yeah, well, there's some pretty simple things that define it. There is a personality of Kasag. That personality has definitely has this this fluid mix of uh, sort of uh, the aloha spirit of uh, of Hawaii, but it also has that mix of the of the Visayan uh, warrior thing, and um, that has these core elements in it. There's, there's some, like we might emphasize long range for a long time, but then we teach the other ranges. And um, <clears throat> there's a core aspect of it that, you know, when I first learned it, uh, we just simply called it Filipino fencing, um, not Filipino martial arts, just this is Filipino fencing. That's what Batikan called it at the time. And so there's, there's these core elements that Kasag has that make it Kasag. So, and that is tied in with his personality, Toby's personality, Maestro Don's personality, CJ's personality, Maestro Lee, Maestro Rico, Maestro Mulconnery. It, all these things are tied in together, but it's like a family, you know? So you got uh, mom and dad, <clears throat> and then you got these five kids or whatever. And all of them have these different personalities, but they're from the same family. So, you know, that same blood line is always there, even down the road hundreds of years or whatever. That same blood is, is still there. And I think that's the way uh, Kasag is. I mean, I might, I might be a romantic for, for that, you know. <clears throat> And I'm not saying that I, I am a, uh, a purist. I'm not a purist at all. I don't say, well, wait a minute. You know, um, we only do these strikes. That's Kasag. We only do the strikes. Well, it's not that way. It's like, yeah, we do those strikes. That's right. That's, that's in Kasag. But, you know, Batikan said this, too. Or he said that also. We, so we, we do those things, too. Batikan didn't say a thing about this particular thing. Well, okay, so you shouldn't be doing it. No, that's not the case. Batikan didn't say a thing about it, but I guarantee you, if he was sitting here today, he would say, yeah, do that. That's a good thing. Go do that. It's good. That's exactly what he would say. If you knew him, that's exactly what he would say. But if he did something stupid, you know, he would say, no, that's pretty stupid. Don't do that. It, it, he was that way too. So I don't, I don't think that should be in the art. Um, you know, we're not, we don't throw shuriken stars. We're not, we're not knife throwers. So let's keep that away, you know, because there's a core still that you're faithful to. And at the core of it, <clears throat> it's a fencing art with multiple types of weapons that inform one another. And, and at the end of the day, they inform it so, they inform you so much that you don't need a weapon at all. You just don't need it. You've got it. You move like you would move in long range. You move in the other ranges, and you've got it. You, what? Where's my weapon? I don't need a weapon. I've got them. It's right here, right? Yeah. Or I've got this. I, I've got. Uh, I've got the wisdom of the art, so I don't go to the places where I have to use it. Mm. I'd rather not. Tobos's art is very well known and very well respected and, and very not known at the same time. For the people who don't know of the art, what would you want them to know? Well, um, <clears throat> most people, of course, of course, people that want to know about the art, uh, people that love these arts. So the common person out there, I don't care what they know. 
I, I don't care if they think a person it's important or not. What I would want them to know though as martial arts people is that this art um, isn't trying to be above other arts but it stands alongside of these other arts. So when I say that, what I mean is, what is the core of any martial art? This is a world of fighting and of wars. It's a world of death and dying and murder and so forth. And as nice as some things are, those things always exist. Kasag is like other arts there for one reason. That is for the defense of the innocent, the defense of the self. I mean, you should be innocent if you're attacked, right? The defense of self, the defense of the innocent, the defense uh, of society, so that um, you're a, an element of strength in your community. Uh, how sad it is when you hear the stories of someone that is um, uh, attacked with a machete, because it happens all the time today. It's like you've gone into some other time period or some other country, but it happens all the time in the United States even. But it's so sad when you hear that and you think if only that person would have had some basic training, they would have moved at an angle. They would have gone underneath the strike or something like that. You just tend to think that there's value in these fighting arts that every man should have, every woman should have, uh, a knowledge of it because it's important you know um, it, it's not that you need all of this to to defend life but um, it doesn't hurt to keep training all your life for that one moment right you don't want to fail in that one moment how long do you think it should take someone to be proficient at an art not a level of mastery but proficiency every art should have an almost immediate level of proficient knowledge. So by that I mean that, um, of course I, I, I can speak from this art form. Every art form should teach the, some basic principles to begin with that can be used immediately. And proficiency in anything only comes from repetition. You have to you have to continue practicing all the time. That's one thing. The other thing is you have to have control over your mental life in order to make this art efficient in the mental life. If it's not efficient in the mental life and the physical life will never come about for, for having proficiency. So by that, I guess I mean that, so one class, first class, what did you learn? Okay, well, I learned that there's this, uh, I can be attacked from this angle. I learned I could be attacked from this angle and these angles. And I learned that if I'm out of the way, I, I don't get hit. Or if I run away, I don't get hit. Uh, if I, if I uh, move and I stop it, I don't know if it's gonna work or not, but, those are, but at least I know that there's these angles of attack. I know that there's people out there that I don't even know that probably want to kill me. And so I have to watch out for them, so I have to be alert. So part of it is my mental life. I don't want to be oblivious to the fact that I live in that world of fighting and wars. Uh, I want to be aware of it. I, want to, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to be oblivious to the fact that um, there, if I can, so I've been to class once, I learned these angles. I've been to class twice, I learned how to, uh, how to deal with these angles. That's all I know. Maybe that's all you need, mm -hmm. right? I, I, and so I've been, I've been thinking that way for 57 years now. How do I, okay, so I've got this angle of attack. How can I deal with it? Um, what should I do? But it's just as basic as if I just started in my thinking. You know, it's the same stuff I would tell anybody right at the start. Well, here's some options. You know, you can do this, you can do that, but you have to think about it. You have to see it up here in, in, your, in your mind and, and wonder to yourself, <clears throat> what would I do? How would I react? You don't walk down the street in oblivion with your phone or whatever. You're looking, I don't even know how people do that, how they don't fall over on their face. 
<clears throat> some do, but <laughs> you don't just you just don't walk right down the street and think that someone's not going to come up from behind because it's a game now. In fact, come up be from behind and uh, uh, sucker punch you, and and you know kill you even. So you you want to be aware, uh, and that's that's the highest thing probably is being aware, thinking that it can happen. You see someone someone coming at you. Uh, how do you carry yourself? How are they how are they moving towards you? I mean, at first it's very conscious. Later on, it's not conscious because it's so ingrained in your thinking. Oh, you heard fast shuffling behind you. Well, could that mean something? Yeah, it could mean someone's coming up from behind me, right? So I want to step off, step off line. I don't want to. I want to stay on the same line. If I step off line, they have to step off line to to get me. If that's what's happening, simple things, right? You said that you had your reasons to not really want to go the direction of uh, tournament, full contact, sparring, that kind of thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Well, um, I've done that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I participated in two full contact tournaments, and it was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, in one of them, I was, in, I was like the Michelin man. I could hardly move because you have to be so geared up so you don't uh, get hurt. I still got hurt, but that was okay. I, I enjoyed that. I think, I tend to think that there's a lot, of, a lot to be gained by, by entering into full contact. But when I talk about a lot to be gained, what I mean is that you're going into the arena of, of battle, basically. It's a game because you know uh, this is not life and death, but you're going into the arena of battle, you're facing off against an opponent, and um, <clears throat> you're, you're trying to hit them, uh, stay out of the way of their weapon, uh, they're trying to hit you, and so, so you've gotta come up with strategies, right? Different strategies, so I think that's the benefit of that. So, but you asked me why I didn't um, go in that direction as much. For one thing, I, I don't have, I don't have the opportunity. In order to go to a full contact tournament, we would have to travel a long, long ways, and um, it'd have to become something where you can take a team and and compete and so forth. I tend to think that there is more value in training uh, with the art, uh, with the idea of what. What I've told you is I call it the story of one, or the story of two, and that and all that is is the is dealing constantly with um, an attack uh, out of nowhere, not not a not a fight where you're lined up and you know the rules and so forth, but where the attack emerges out of the dark, and um, prepare yourself mentally for that type of thing, to me, is more of an emphasis than getting them into the arena. Plus, I tend to, I tend to think that um, the art, when the art is this, done this way, sometimes students don't realize that that's not the art. That is a fun way to apply the art. It's a, it's, it's a game, really, because it's, there's a winner and loser. But um, it's sort of, uh, I don't want that to be the focus. I, I want the student to understand the, um, the, um, the, that there are many different types of weapons, that um, your environment holds weapons all the time. Learn what those things are. Um, learn to function in a world that someone saw along the line sometime might want to take you out of this world. Um, and it's not going to happen in the arena, <clears throat> but I don't want to seem like I'm anti-competition. Um, anti I'm not. Uh, I'm not at all. I, I've done a lot of it, and I, I really think it's fun. I just don't want to have my emphasis there. I, I want to have my emphasis um, other ways, more ways that will constantly ingrain 
the idea of um, life and death, so to speak. And I don't know if I'm really achieving that, but that's sort of, that's my goal. Uh, you know, so uh, I talk about as much as I can real circumstances with students and try to try to get them try to get them to understand that um, what type of environment the world is. If they understand that, then they'll know that they uh, you know you don't want them paranoid, but uh, we should be a little paranoid maybe about uh, the way things are. You look at what's happening today, and you go, and everybody goes, "Oh, this is horrible today." But you know, it's it's not today. It's it's always the world's always this way, right?